Okay, so uh, Jane, there you are. Uh, <laughs> Jane, you were the one who were ab was able to contact Nicole and get us this opportunity. Tell us a, a little bit about your interest in it and uh, what our expectation is for today. Well, uh, as you know, our speaker is uh, today is Nicole Capps, and she is with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and she's a program analyst with the National Marine Sanctuary in the West Coast Regional Office in Monterey. And Nicole, I may be wrong, but I think you'll be talking about the, the Farallons, the, those islands out west of San Francisco, I think about 25 or 30 miles out there, and also the Monterey Bay Sanctuary. And these, of course, are just two of the protected areas on, off the West Coast. And so I know that we all love our beautiful California coastline, and we look forward to hearing about what issues you're dealing with. And if time permits, uh, questions may be asked. So Nicole, thanks again for agreeing to come and welcome. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and yeah, thank you for, for reaching out and requesting this presentation. I will be honest, I had no idea this organization existed until you emailed me. So I learned something new by you reaching out. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and then just to give maybe a little bit more about my background before I get into the presentation, just so you know who I am. Um, so yeah, as Jane said, I work for our West Coast Regional Office in Monterey, California. I started my time with the federal government in 2002, um, initially starting um, at the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Monterey. Um, and then eventually when our program decided to establish this regional structure um, to help with management, um, I then moved over to the West Coast Regional Office. And so I've been in this office and since I think 2006, 2007. Um, so I'm the assistant to our regional director. So as Jane said, I'm a program analyst, right? So that's just a very, you know, uh, as we all know, government term. Um, that means so many different things, depending on what organization you're with. Um, so for me, it just basically means that I'm the assistant to our regional director, Bill Duros. Um, I have a background in law enforcement, and so I don't touch on this a whole lot in the presentation, um, but each of our sanctuaries has a set, of, a set of regulations, right? And so with regulations then comes enforcement of those regulations. And so we, within the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, don't have the ability to enforce our own regulations, so we rely on our sister line office, the National Marine Fisheries Service, and their branch of law enforcement to enforce our regulations. So I work closely with that branch and then also other federal and state enforcement partners to ensure that our regulations are being enforced. Um, so that's a little bit about myself and my time here within uh, NOAA and the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So let me go ahead and see about getting this screen shared for you so you can actually see my presentation. So just bear with me for a moment because I typically don't use Zoom, although we did do a um, test run of this. So if you could just let me know if you're seeing my slides now. Yes, we can see your slides. Okay, great, perfect, because it still says loading on my end. So as long as you can see it, that's all that matters. <laughs> um, so I assume you're seeing the blue slide with the whale tail right now? Yes. Perfect, great. Um, so as Jane said, I was asked to talk a bit about the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary and the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary specifically, but I would like to start first with um, giving you a little bit of background on our overall program first, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail and, and give some examples of, of things that are happening at those two sites here on the West Coast. So to start, um, just a little bit about our organization. You'll see that this is kind of the, the chain of command as it is, as, as it were, um, through the federal government. So starting on the left-hand side of the slide here is the Department of Commerce. That's our parent government entity that we fall under. So within the Department of Commerce, of course, is then the National Ocean, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or more commonly known as NOAA. And of course, when people hear the word NOAA, they oftentimes think of one of our sister line offices, the National Weather Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service. 
Um, but within NOAA is the National Ocean Service, so a sister to those two line offices I just referenced. And that's where the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries of the program I work for resides is within the National Ocean Service. And you'll see here on this slide um, our vision and our mission, and that is to protect our nation's underwater treasures and inspire healthy oceans um, in the communities. Um, and so you'll see that we protect not only just ocean water, but we also protect the great, some of the Great Lakes as well um, with our mandate. Um, and so, yeah, while we're technically considered marine protected areas, we really consider ourselves to be um, protecting underwater parks. So that's how we see ourselves. So in 1972, um, what is now called the National Marine Sanctuaries Act was first passed into law. And this particular act is what has stood up um, our program, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. And so I just want to read a few lines from that act um, to give you a better sense of who we are and what it is that we do. But a National Marine Sanctuary is a federally designated area within United States waters that protects areas of the marine environment with special conservation, recreational, ecological, historical, cultural, archaeological, scientific, educational, or aesthetic qualities. And so the Sanctuaries Act mandates that to identify and designate as national marine sanctuaries areas of the marine environment, which are of special national significance, and to manage these areas as the national marine sanctuary system. So the Office of National Marine Sanctuary serves as a trustee for a network of underwater parks that encompasses more than 600,000 square miles of marine and Great Lake waters, going from here on the West Coast off the state of Washington, all the way to the Florida Keys in the Southeast, from Lake Huron and the Great Lakes out to American Samoa. So our network of marine protected areas includes a system of 15 national marine sanctuaries and two marine national monuments. So the National Marine Sanctuary Act allows for public and private uses of sanctuaries that are consistent with our primary mission of resource protection. And you'll see here on this particular slide, uh, a wide variety of those public and private uses, right? So while we are protecting these places and all of the, the resources within these special places, we're still allowing for multiple compatible uses. And so it's unfortunate that our own name, the word sanctuary is a challenge to our real identity. And that when people hear the term sanctuary, they oftentimes think of closure, right? They think, well, if it's a sanctuary, then it must mean that I can't go into it. I can't fish in it. I can't surf in it. I can't dive in it. I can't boat in it. And it's actually completely the opposite. Out of the 15 national marine sanctuaries in our system, in fact, only about 2% of those sanctuaries are actually fully closed areas. So the other 98% we allow all of these uses that you see here on the screen and, and quite possibly more. So to look at our entire system as a whole here on this map, and we, we do need to update this map as of last week, the 15th sanctuary just came online um, with us. So I'll just kind of go around the horn real quick here on the map. So you'll see um, starting down in the Gulf of Mexico is the, floor, uh, the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary working its way out to Florida, the Florida Keys, protecting a good swath of the Florida Keys. The Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary is a, an offshore sanctuary, so there is quite a bit of travel needed to get out to that site. Um, moving further north up the East Coast is the Monitor, which was our very first sanctuary that was designated, and it's protecting the USS Monitor, an ironclad warship from the Civil War. Um, one of our newer and designated in 2019 sanctuaries um, is the Mallows Bay Potomac River and then the Stellwagen Bank Sanctuary, which is off the state of Massachusetts. So then moving inland, you'll see that we have the Lake Ontario, which is currently a proposed National Marine Sanctuary. So it's going through the process for potential designation of a sanctuary. Um, and then the other one um, in the Great Lakes was, is the Wisconsin Lake Michigan Sanctuary. Um, and that's the one that I said that just came online last week. It's, it's brand new, was just announced to us last week as having come online as an actual sanctuary. So this map will be updated to reflect that. 
Um, but then also in the Great Lakes is the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, protecting quite a few shipwrecks that are in the Great Lakes. Then moving next out to the Pacific region, you'll see all the way out in Hawaii, there's the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale Sanctuary, which currently, currently is really just protecting humpback whales. Um, and then the American Sam, and the sanctuary down in American Samoa. And you'll see the two triangles in the Pacific are the two marine national monuments that I referenced a minute ago, Rose Atoll, and then in protecting the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands is the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And so then now finally moving to the West Coast here, we have five national marine sanctuaries off the West Coast. Um, the first at the very northern part is the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Washington. And then um, unique to our program off the state of California are four national marine sanctuaries. So today again, we'll be really focusing on the greater Farallons and Monterey Bay na National Marine Sanctuaries, but there's also a small site, Cordell Bank, and then the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, which is protecting five of the Channel Islands down in Southern California. So zooming in on that map a little bit closer, um, you'll see we have a very unique situation here in Central California in that three of our sanctuaries off the Central California coast share contiguous boundaries. So these three sites in particular do work, even though they're individual sites, they do work quite closely together with their regulations, with their messaging, with their education and outreach and, and research. Um, so <clears throat> the unique thing about the West Coast is that even though each of these sanctuaries are unique unto themselves, all five West Coast National Marine Sanctuaries share a, um, a unique feature in that they're all linked by the California current. So this is a very cold, nutrient-rich current that's running southward along the Pacific or along the West Coast. Um, and this particular current provides an abundance and diversity of ocean life that is found in really only a few other places on the planet. So again, even though they're all unique and have unique features, um, they're all linked in that way. So focusing first on the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, this particular sanctuary was designated in 1981 it currently protects a little over 3,200 square miles of the California coastline and waters. Um, I should say waters, not coastline. Um, and so you'll see here on the map, I don't know if you can see my cursor at all, um, but it's southern boundary really starts from shore um, in Marin County, works its way down south to go around the Farallon Islands as Jane referenced, coming closer into shore and then going back outwards and then ending at the, uh, the northernmost point just north of Point Arena. And so again, the unique feature that, that this um, sanctuary has protected since 1981 is the Farallon Islands. Next, I just wanna mention the third contiguous, the third sanctuary that shares these boundaries with Greater Farallons and Monterey Bay. I won't touch on it much more than this, but I did wanna make reference to it is the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary. So this is the smallest sanctuary we have on the West Coast. It was established in 1989. It's um, a completely offshore site, as you can see here. Its boundaries do not come to shore like Greater Farallones does. Um, its eastern boundary here is um, about six miles from shore and its western boundary reaches now, extends out all the way to in, um, include Bodega Canyon. So this feature at the northernmost part of the sanctuary. But since its inception in 1989, its main purpose um, was to protect this unique underwater feature, which is Cordell Bank, where it gets its name from. So this is an underwater bank that's just teeming with life. You can see this photo in the upper left corner is from the bank itself. And you can just see the abundance of corals, anemones, and fish that surround this bank. So this particular sanctuary protects a little over 1,200 square miles of, of the Pacific Ocean. And then the third Central California site is the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. This is the largest of the five West Coast sanctuaries, um, the largest, of course, in California. It was uh, designated in 1992, and it protects uh, a little over 6,000 square miles of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, protects 276 miles, it stretches, I should say, 276 miles of the Central California coastline, um, going all the way from the northern, northern end uh, in Marin County, all the way down south to Cambria. 
So its average um, distance from shore is approximately 30 miles. You'll see one of the unique features that this sanctuary protects right here in the middle of Monterey Bay is the town, small, small little town of Moss Landing. And off Moss Landing, you'll see that the Monterey Canyon begins and works its way out all the way out to the deep ocean. So this canyon is at its deepest point, a little over 12,700 feet deep. So it's a very unique feature to, um, to the West Coast here. Um, and then additionally, another unique feature that was added to the sanctuary's boundaries a few years ago, several years ago now, is similar to Cordell Bank, this underwater seamount. So it's called Davidson Seamount. Again, an underwater seamount that's just teeming with life. And so that was its reason for being added to the sanctuary is to protect it from potential future harm. So the mandate of the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, as I mentioned previously, we are the trustee for this network of underwater parks. And our program works with a, a diverse group of partners and stakeholders to promote responsible, sustainable ocean uses that ensure the health of these special ocean places. So we manage living resources as well as manage maritime heritage resources. And so the way in which we achieve our mandate is through four key, I would say, focus areas. And those are conservation, research and monitoring, education and outreach, and community engagement. So for the Greater Farallons and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries, if you were to look at their programming and look at how their staff is broken out, you'll see that they, they all focus on one or more of these key focus areas. So what I'll do is kind of touch on examples of how both of these sanctuaries uh, get at these um, four focus areas. So starting with conservation, sanctuary staff are focused on reducing threats to key species and marine habitats, protecting maritime heritage resources and promoting responsible use and coastal resilience. And one example of how Greater Fairlawns does that is with the Seabird Protection Network. So this network is a, a multi-organization collaborative that works to reduce human disturbance to seabirds and other marine wildlife, such as um, uh, sea lions um, and seals. Um, <clears throat> and so they work to protect these along the California coast by partnering with boaters, kayakers, pilots, and seabird biologists to reduce disturbance to, this, to these wildlife. So as you can see here in this image, Seabirds gather in large groups on offshore rocks, cliffs, and islands, and they nest and raise their young on these cliffs and rocks. So when we as humans get too close, approach them too fast, or make too much noise, that tends to then cause a disturbance which disrupts their natural behavior. And so it just causes unnecessary stress to the animals. Um, so any activity that disrupts the natural behaviors of the marine wildlife is considered a disturbance, is a violation of a regulation that we have. And so the Seabird Protection Network, what they oftentimes will do is they have seabird biologists that will go out to certain cliffs and areas within the Greater Fairlawns boundaries and monitor these seabirds. And what they'll do while they're there is also document any disturbance that they're seeing by passing pot planes or kayakers getting too close and then that they document that and that allows us to potentially develop some sort of an outreach education and outreach program to work with let's say a pilots association or you know kayakers and and just educate them on you know um the proper way to you know be out on the water and and not harm and disturb wildlife so if you happen to be out um within the boundaries of the greater Fairlands national marine sanctuary and witness a disturbance of a seabird you can report disturbances to their website at seabirdprotectionnetwork.org. So if you were interested, that's where you could get more information and report a disturbance. So for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, one, um, one way in which they um, achieve the mandate of conservation is through their water quality protection program. So the sanctuary recognized that water quality is key. Good water quality is key to ensuring protection for all sanctuary resources. So they partnered with eight federal, state, and local agencies on a memorandum of agreement, or MOA, to work together to develop and collaborate in a water quality protection program for the sanctuary. So this committee 
um, is dedicated to protecting and enhancing water quality in the Monterey Bay Sanctuary and its watersheds by using a, a collaborative approach. Um, and in that they involve key stakeholders in seven issue areas. And so just to highlight those for you, it's agriculture and rural lands is one, beach closures and microbial contaminations, urban runoff, wetlands and riparian corridors, marinas and boating, regional monitoring, and a citizen watershed monitoring network. And I'll talk a little bit more about that network um, a little bit later. So the second focus area for our mandate is research and monitoring. So staff focus on learning more about our sanctuaries, tracking and predicting conditions and trends, and understanding the value of sanctuaries to our nation through research and monitoring. One way or one example um, in which Monterey Bay has been doing research is, through, is with ocean noise. So low frequency sound from large vessels is a major global source of ocean noise that can interfere with acoustic communication for a variety of marine animals. So marine shipping is a dominant source of low frequency anthropogenic noise in the ocean. So researchers using passive acoustic monitoring off California have identified increasing trends in low frequency ocean noise attributed to an increase in commercial ship traffic along the West Coast. However, um, research found that in 2020, due to COVID-19, there was a reduction in maritime shipping, right? So this resulted in reduced low frequency ocean levels um, documented in areas of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary as a result, right? There's less ships going through um, along the West Coast. So what this basically means then in the end is that there's less time during which vessel noise could make communication or reduce communication range or induce stress on the animals. And then an example of research and monitoring for the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary is the Applied California Current Ecosystem Studies or ACCESS, which is a partnership that supports marine wildlife conservation and healthy marine ecosystems in Northern and Central California by conducting ocean research to inform resource managers, policymakers, and conservation partners. So since 2004, ACCESS has conducted oceanographic and biological sampling, including seabirds, marine mammals, and turtle abundance and distribution, ship traffic, acoustic and net sampling of zooplankton, water column nutrients, and also monitoring pH for ocean acidification. So as you can see, it's been, and it's been around since 2004, so we have many years of, of data in all of these areas to know um, trends or emerging issues. So then in the, key, the third key focus area of education and outreach, um, staff at both of these sites work to expand recognition of national marine sanctuaries. They work to increase public engagement and create a vision for the next 50 years of sanctuaries. So both Greater Farallons and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries have visitor centers. Um, Greater Farallons has a small visitor center at their offices at the Presidio in San Francisco. The Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, as you can see here in this picture, this is their larger of the two visitor centers they have. This is the Sanctuary Exploration Center in Santa Cruz. So it's at the end of the beach boardwalk, if you're familiar with Santa Cruz in that area, and it's across from um, the, the pier, the boardwalk. Um, and then in the southernmost extent of the sanctuary in San Simeon is the Coastal Discovery Center, a, a much smaller visitor center than the one you see here. Um, and it's directly across Highway 1 from Hearst Castle at, at William Randolph Hearst State Beach. And both sanctuaries, Greater Farallons and Monterey Bay um, Sanctuary, have education and outreach staff who develop curriculum um, and do outreach to school groups. So if you were to visit the respective websites for both of these sanctuaries, as well as visiting the website for our national office in, in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, you will find, if, if you were a teacher or know of any teachers, that there is curriculum available for teachers to use within their classrooms. Um, we also have staff that will, or programs that will um, go into the classrooms um, and, and do some programming, um, and then also potentially take students out into the field and do maybe some citizen science out in the field. 
Um, I know for Greater Fairlawns, their website is very extensive with um, what it is that they do with, with school age children um, and school groups, whether it be in the classroom, on the shore, or even um, after school programming that can be done at the offices in San Francisco. And then the fourth key focus area of our mandate is community engagement. So our program realized that for a sanctuary to be successful, it has to have the support and involvement of the communities that border that sanctuary. So one way in which our overall program, and it's particularly for Greater Fairlands and Monterey Bay, in which we have community engagement is through our sanctuary advisory councils. So the advisory councils are community-based advisory groups that were established to provide advice and recommendations to the sanctuary superintendents on issues including management, science, service, and stewardship. Um, and as you can see here, the advisory councils represent a diverse group of stakeholders. So you can see anywhere from commercial fishing and recreational fishing to a youth representative, um, diving, conservation. We have also federal government representatives that sit on these advisory councils to get advice and input from our partner federal agencies. Um, and so all of these advisory council meetings are open to the public. Each site has um, a sanctuary advisory council that meets on a different schedule. So if you were interested in attending any of their meetings, you would just need to go to the respective um, website for that sanctuary to find out what their schedule is. They all should be listed on their website. Um, and as of course, similar to how you guys are doing this meeting via Zoom, throughout COVID, they have been um, remote or um, virtual as we are now. Um, and typically in the past, they would get together and meet in person. Um, and we'll just have to kind of see what the future holds for that. If we're gonna go back to in-person or continue with online or some sort of a hybrid, I don't know yet, but um, but they are open to the public. So you would be able to participate and provide comment on, on topics on the agenda and then also not on the agenda. If there is some sort of an issue or emerging issue you might have. So just know that they are open to you. Um, and then, then just to clarify the numbers on this slide on the left and the right hand side, that is representative of our, of our entire program. So looking at all of the advisory councils across the program, the 15 sanctuaries, um, these are the, the numbers in which um, we have people representing those seats. So that's what the numbers are on this particular slide. And then another way in which we have community engagement is through our volunteer programming. Um, so each sanctuary has a volunteer group that is either on the water or on the shore that work to further our mission. Uh, because, you know, we even though we have you know, a decent number of people on our staff, we can only do so much with those individuals. So we uh, expand our reach through our volunteer programs. So the Greater Fairlawns has a long-standing citizen science program called Beach Watch, which these uh, volunteers go out and survey and document the resources of the sanctuary. So they walk certain beaches within the boundaries of the sanctuary, um, documenting any dead seabirds and marine mammals they encounter they may detect um, natural or human caused disturbances such as an oil spill. Um, they may document and exchange information on the biological and physical changes a particular beach may undergo throughout the various seasons over the course of several years. Um, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary actually has four different volunteer groups. The first being Baynet, which is um, a group of naturalists, trained naturalists that engage with the public by introducing them to the sanctuary and local wildlife as seen from shore through binoculars or scopes. So they basically stand up binoculars or scopes along the recreation trail in Monterey um, and will engage people as they walk by to just try and educate them on the fact that, hey, did you know that this is a protected place? This is a national marine sanctuary. Here's what that means. And oh, by the way, here, look through these binoculars and see this very cute sea otter, right? And, and may give them um, some more details on the marine life that they're seeing. So the second program is Team Ocean. So similar to Baynet, um, it's also a naturalist um, uh, volunteer program, but they're based on the water. They actually are trained in um, how to kayak, the basics of kayaking. And they actually get out in, in on the water during the summer months when we have an influx of tourists in the area and just get on the water and engage with um, other kayakers, again, just to ensure that 
they know that this is a protected place, this is a sanctuary, here's what that means, and to be respectful of the wildlife that they may encounter while on the water in a kayak. Um, similar to the Greater Fairlawns Beach Watch uh, Volunteer Program, Monterey Bay has a program called Beach Comers, which similar goes along various feet, walk along various beaches within the boundaries of the Monterey Bay Sanctuary, documenting dead seabirds and marine mammals and just you know documenting other things that they see while they're out on the beach. And then last, I mentioned when we were discussing or when I talked about water quality was the Citizen Watershed Monitoring Network. So this is a group of volunteers that go out and collect and test water samples to assist the water quality protection program. So within that citizen watershed monitoring network, um, there are actually several different events that may occur throughout the year where the volunteers will be going out to collect and test water samples. So for instance, there's an event called First Flush, which is really the volunteers going out at any point in the day or night um, during the first major rain that we have of the season to take samples of what's being flushed from shore and into the sanctuary during that big rain event. Um, so those are the four volunteer programs that Monterey Bay Sanctuary offers to the public. And with that, I think yep, we're at the end. So I just wanted to see, you'll see here at the bottom of the slide, the respective websites for the Greater Farallones and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries. If you wanna write those down, feel free of course to go to their website. Um, our headquarters website, as I mentioned, also has some really great photos and videos and resources such as curriculum for folks. So um, that's sanctuaries.noaa.gov. Um, you could also visit that website as well if you wanna learn more about our overall program or any of the other sites within the, the National Marine Sanctuary system. And then I guess with that, I'll ask, were there any questions? I'll leave that slide up for another moment or so and then stop sharing. I have a question. This is Pauline. Yes, I'm wondering, um, mm -hmm. I had heard uh, a couple years ago that there were issues of like naval ships using sonar and disrupting whales. Do you know if that's still going on or have they cut back on using sonar? Do you guys get involved with that? Oh, uh, we do. Um, we do work with them on that. And I know actually the, our program, not myself in particular, um, I'm not an expert in this area, unfortunately, but I do know others within our program have been working with the Navy um, to uh, do some research and monitoring within sanctuaries, again, kind of on, on the topic of ocean noise um, and are, are working with them on that. But to say whether or not they are still doing it or not, I don't actually know. I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that, but I do know that we are working with the Navy on, on um, sonar and ocean noise. Jane, do you have a question? You're on, you're on mute, Jane. Jane. On mute, okay. So um, I'm wondering, just among many other things, uh, the populations of the sea otters, have, how, do you have any information on that? Are they recovering? Or I've also heard that sea otters uh, were dying because of uh, some microbes that were uh, being sent into the bay by, this is a Monterey Bay, by rivers and the, a lot of the microbes came from cat feces, which mm -hmm. feeds into the, so I'm wondering how are the uh, Monterey Bay uh, sea otters faring now? Are they, I haven't seen very many of them out there, you know, they're, so I wonder how is that population holding up? Yeah, um, you know what? I don't know where the population stands currently. Um, I'm not, I'm not a researcher, one, but then also um, I don't, we don't really do, as far as I'm aware, and, and at the Monterey Bay Sanctuary, a lot of research on otters. Um, we rely on some of our, our sister or fellow organizations like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, even maybe the Monterey Bay Aquarium here locally to do some of that, mm -hmm. um, and some other uh, NGOs that are focused on sea otters. Um, but I will say just living in Monterey, 
Um, I live about two blocks from the water, thankfully, very uh, fortunate, and um, have seen quite a quite a bit, quite an abundance of them lately within the kelp forests off Cannery Row and, and Monterey Bay. Right. So I think they're doing okay, but I don't know exactly where their numbers are at and, and how that relates to previous numbers. Mm -hmm. So I could certainly inquire though and get back to you, Jane. I do have your email, so I could I could find that out for you. Be nice to know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's good to know that. What can I say? One other thing. Not too long ago, uh, we were looking out at the bay and saw so many squid fishing boats. And at, at nighttime, you can go out and see them. They're, they sort of light way out there on the horizon because the boats have these uh, lights shining over the, each side of the boat, which apparently attracts the squid. And then they just have to scoop them up. But squid would be a food source for a lot of things, uh, whales or um, sharks or other an other animal life there. So I just wonder how how is that affected? I mean, is anybody keeping track of that? I must. I think there must have been fifty boats out there. Lots of them. yes, there there were a lot this year. I I saw them you saw as that well. Too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They were off uh, the shores of Monterey Bay for quite a while um, in quite an abundance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it is regulated. That fishery is regulated through the state of California and through the National Marine Fisheries Service. So again, our sister organization within NOAA, they um, have actually quite strict regulations on when the season open opens, when it closes. Uh, if I recall correctly, they even had to finish by noon on Fridays. I'm not really sure why that is, but I, I just know that was part of it as well. Um, and then I think there also are catch limits. So, you know, there's, there's some sort of a limit in how much they can catch as well, I think. So, um, so it, is being, it is being regulated, not necessarily by, by our organization, but by other organizations within the federal and state government. So they're watching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nicole, how, how did you get involved in this? How did you get into this field, uh, uh, this opportunity to uh, preserve things? Uh, yeah, it's actually an interesting story in that I grew up in Arizona, so in the middle of the oh, desert. <laughs> <laughs> happened to go to the library one day and check out a book on sharks, and that's what got me really interested in the ocean. We, my family would vacation each summer in San Diego. Um, my dad was a Marine, so we were stationed in Arizona, but um, would oftentimes have to go to San Diego for medical care. Um, and so that's what started my love for the ocean. And I... I learned pretty quickly in my college career that I didn't quite have the head for science um, that I thought I did. Um, and so that's when I kind of took a pivot and ended up in the law enforcement realm. But I was very fortunate in that, um, like I said, in 2002, the Monterey Bay Sanctuary was looking for a very entry level position. I applied and got the job and I've been able to kind of, you know, progress my career here within sanctuaries over the years. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I just always, for whatever reason, just always really had a passion for the ocean and enjoyed it. And so I'm very thankful to uh, be able to do this in my day-to-day -day job. Wow. Yeah, and work with some amazing people as well. And, and, and right now, what, is, what do you actually spend most of your time doing? Um, yeah, right now I do spend quite a bit of time on, in, in, our enforcement end of things. That is a good hefty chunk of my time um, in that, you know, we, we really have started on the West Coast here a method to document all of the calls or emails we'll get from our partners, from the public on, hey, I was standing on the beach and I saw this. I don't think this is right. You know, so they're reporting something um, to us that could be a potential violation of one of our regulations. And and how do we follow up with that? And how do we work with our enforcement partners on that? So a lot of my time is spent um, coordinating with our enforcement partners, coordinating with our enforcement, what we call enforcement coordinators at each of our five sites on the West Coast to just ensure that, you know, that everything's being followed up on. Um, because as, as you can imagine, it's, it's a lengthy process, right? If, if there is an actual violation of our regulation and all the steps that it needs to go through to an actual potential prosecution in the end. And our sanctuary, um, the Sanctuaries Act, um, none of our, really none of our regulations are any criminal violations, they would all be civil violations. So there's typically just a monetary 
um, penalty in the end that someone might pay if there is a violation of a regulation. So a lot of my, my time is spent with our enforcement. And the, so the four uh, we you know that you showed on the map, that's your region? Is that how it works or no? Yeah, so our region is actually the five on the West Coast. So the four within the state of California oh, and, and the then one, one up the state of Washington, oh, yeah. Okay. So we work with, like I mentioned earlier, we work with our National Marine Fisheries Service. Their Office of Law Enforcement is our main um, law enforcement arm. Um, but then we also have a partnership with the U.S. Coast Guard and with our state partners, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Washington Department, um, Washington, MVP, uh, yeah, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. <laughs> A lot of acronyms. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Great. Well, it sounds like, a, actually, it sounds like a fun job. <laughs> it is. I enjoy it. Yeah. So I've been here 20 some odd years now. <laughs> yeah. Well, you showed have that one picture out there? Oh. I have a question. Um, I'm just curious. I don't, I'm not sure I even know how to ask this question. You're talking about the Cordell Bank. Yes. How, what went into discovering that and determining that it needed to be its own sanctuary? Is that even a question that can be answered? Um, it could be answered by probably somebody at that particular site. <laughs> um, I, I actually, because it was designated in 1989, I actually honestly don't know what went into discovering Cordell Bank. Um, to be honest, I should know that though. That's a very good question. Um, but with all of our sanctuaries, um, it is very much a from the bottom up process. So there is a lot of community input and engagement on whether or not a sanctuary, an area of the ocean should be considered for sanctuary designation. So I don't fully know what went into the process for the Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Um, but I can say it probably did include quite a bit of public input and, and thought into the process. Um, so the, the process as it is stands right now is, um, you know, a, a, any public entity or individual could recommend a site for a designation. It would then get put on a nomination list and be considered. Um, but there is a, definitely a set of criteria that are needed to be met in order to actually go on the nomination list. Um, uh, so anyway, so I, I don't fully know exactly what went into, unfortunately, the the, the research of, of the Cordell Bank and how it was um, initially found and then what went into the designation process. Just again, it just well, was before. Well, you know, generally, how, how does the whole process begin? And you answered that very well. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jane, were you saying some question? I just wanted to mention that you, you showed a picture of the uh, the uh, NOAA uh, Visitor Center in Santa Cruz. And, and I have been there and it is beautiful. So if anyone is in Santa Cruz, it's, it's really worth a visit. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would definitely say if you plan to visit anytime soon, check the website first, because obviously given COVID, we had to close the visitor centers and as of today, they're still not open, um, but hopefully that will change soon um, as you know, things progress within the state and counties. Um, so yeah, hopefully our program will allow that to happen here at some point in some capacity, whether it, you know, with reduced numbers or whatnot, but yeah, we're very, very happy and proud of that, that visitor center. Thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the the one the visitor center at uh, in San Francisco at the Presidio? Sure, it's it's actually a very small visitor center, and I think a majority of the individuals that do go through there are scheduled school groups. Mm -hmm. um, I, they do, I think, have kind of some hours, but um, it's best to just go to their website and see again when they do open. Um, what those hours are, but it is it is a rather small visitor center. It's not on the same scale or extent as the the one that I showed in that image on the slide. Um, but they do take a, I know a lot of school groups through the visitor center, and they usually have that scheduled in advance. So if we wanted to go on a field trip, we could potentially contact them and. Mm -hmm. Oh. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the the staff person that you'd want to contact there, his name is Justin Hole, H O L L. Um, and you can find his information on the website um, when you go to the visitor center, um, but he would be your main point of contact for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? Um, well, um, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, I, I, it, it was really a great presentation and I appreciate it. And, and you know, it reminds us, I think, of why we asked public servants to come and present at our meetings. Um, it's, it's important, I think, for us to see, you know, the value of public service to reiterate to ourselves and to the rest of the federal workforce, uh, the importance of it and the contribution that you folks make uh, that we've made in our careers. And um, so that, that to me is a significant uh, thing that, that we are thankful for. And we are very appreciative of what you're doing uh, to help protect and, 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 and allow uh, these reserves to function as they should. Um, so I, you know, thanks very much for participating. I, I know you didn't know who we were, and, and but the fact is you were open to it. You were you were willing to take a chance here, <laughs> and uh, that's really nice, and, and I appreciate it. And uh, so um, again, thanks very much, and thanks Jane. Jane Jane always is, has been an advocate for a long time to want to try to get the federal workforce involved in our programs uh, because we believe that that's where we come from and we believe that there's so much important information programs uh, accomplishments going on because of the federal public servants and so you know this is a great opportunity for us and and we continue in our programs to do that and you are we are your your narf is your voice in congress <laughs> uh, that's our really important function is you'll probably hear from me from, from me nicole and I'll, I'll 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 offer you a free membership to our chapter <laughs> <laughs> got it well i i thank you thank you jerry thank you jane again for reaching out um we're, we're always happy to you know educate others on our our tiny little program sure. within the, wow. the larger federal government right because in the yeah. grand scheme of things we are fairly small um, and so I, I really appreciate the opportunity for, you know, that to give you guys an education on who we are, but then also to be able to learn, yeah, exactly who, who you guys are, um, and that this organization is out there for someone like myself, right, as a federal employee. So Exactly, really yeah, and, and we've been around, for, this is our 100th anniversary this year, so mm -hmm. it's pretty that. amazing that, that it has gone on. For, for so long and hopefully it will continue. Anyway, thanks again. Uh, thanks all of you who participated and, and uh, came to the meeting today. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, you know, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, we do have our email, narf65 uh, at gmail.com and anyone can write us anytime and we'll respond and try to help you out with whatever it is. Uh, so thanks again. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nicole. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank Bye you. for now. Bye. Bye. Thank you.